and a special thank you to Esther and Andy. Um, Esther and I go way back really to high school years and it's just a pleasure to be here with her um, and to see her and Andy on the screen. Um, Andy seems to have gotten gray and Esther remains eternally young. So uh, that's lovely to see. Uh, Ari, can you give me a thumbs up? Am I coming through loud and clear? I can't tell whether people hear me or not. If you hear me, give me a thumbs up. No thumbs up, that's not good. You are good. You're doing, everybody can hear you. Oh, good, all right. Well then let me start. Um, Ari mentioned that in 2007, I taught at the Pontifical Gregorian University. I was on sabbatical from the Jewish Theological Seminary and uh, I managed to wrangle myself a wonderful appointment. I was called the master visiting professor of Jewish studies. Um, it isn't nearly quite as lofty as it sounds. The um, position was actually funded by Richard and Susan Master. So they lent their name to the lectureship and it made it sound much more fancy than I thought it would be. Um, nevertheless, the Gregorian is the jewel in the crown of the Papal system. It's where Pope Francis went to school and the Gregorian trains Jesuits. It is the premier university in the Vatican system. And when I spoke with the interlocutor who was bringing me to Rome, he said to me, Bert, you know, we can open doors for you that you normally would not have opened for you in New York or even as a tourist here in Rome. So I'm inviting you to ask, I'll give you three wishes. Since I knew the priest well, I said to him, Joseph, you do understand, you're inviting a New York Jew to be chutzpahdik. And he said, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the worst that'll happen is I'll say no. I said, okay, these are my three wishes in no special order. Number one, I'd like an audience with the Pope. Number two, I want to be able to go to the Vatican Museum after hours when no one else is there. And number three, I want to go to the Jewish catacombs in Rome. Now, I had been to the Christian catacombs. They're well ventilated. They've been well lit. Uh, they have literally millions of tourists uh, every year. But the Jewish catacombs have remained largely close to the public, and they're not well known. So my friend Joseph, Father Joseph, wrote back immediately. He said, number one, it's easy for me to get you an audience with the Pope. This was, by the way, in 2007, Pope Benedict. Number two, he said, as it happens, one of the students in your class is a tour guide at the Vatican Museum. She will take you around after hours. He said, number three, going to the catacombs, that's going to be a little harder. It might in, involve a certain, and he was fumfering in email, it might involve a certain a certain, a certain, I finally emailed him, okay, Joseph, say it. He said, well, you might have to pay someone off. So the day came and there I was, I was dropped off in a taxi cab and they told me to ask the cab driver to go to the Christian catacombs of San Calisto and then cross the street. The street is the famous Via Appia, the Appian Way. I crossed the street and there is a cyclone fence with a huge padlock on it. And behind the fence, it's overgrown with weeds. Before I can get back in the taxi, he takes off and I'm just trapped there all alone. I'm nervous, I'm looking, I'm looking at my watch. And about three minutes after the appointed time, a guy shows up on a Vespa, sure enough, you know, we're really in Rome. He shows up on his little motorcycle, hops off the motorcycle, takes off his helmet, and says to me in Italian, you the rabbi? I said, yes, I am. And he holds out his hand like this. So I shook his hand. And then he looks at me and holds out his hand like this again. I realized, ah, right. I put a wad of, it was long ago, enough ago, I think it was lira, not even euros, in his hand. 
He takes a look at it, st- stuffs in his pocket and says, walk this way. Um, I follow him and we get to another padlock door after hacking our way through this weedy uh, yard. We get to this big padlock door. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a set of keys, takes off the padlock, opens the door and reaches in and puts on a miner's cap. Then he gives me a miner's cap to wear and a lantern. He said, where we're going, it's going to be very dark. It's underground. I figured like, all right, it's the catacombs. I knew what I was buying. We go down and we go down and we go down and we go down. And he turns to me as we get to the bottom and he says, stay close. You don't want to get lost in here. The catacombs go on for miles. If you get lost, you could be here for months. I said, "Uh, okay, I will stay close to you. But um, what's the best way to follow you? He said, well, put your hand up on the wire. I said, wait, aren't you here to check that the wire doesn't have shorts and you're wearing thick gloves? I don't want to touch the wire. He said, well, then you better stay close. So I stayed very close to him. And um, as we walk, we're shining with our heads and our lantern. And the first thing I see is what you're looking at in the uh, PowerPoint slideshow. And as you can see, it's got a menorah. And the menorah is the ubiquitous, absolutely ubiquitous sign of Jewish arts throughout the Roman world. Jews made the menorah everywhere they could. You can see to our right of the menorah, there's a lulav and an etrog. And to the left of the menorah, there is a shofar that reminds me to tell all of you Chodesh Tov. We've just begun the month of Elul. And for those of you who are shul goers, you're going to start hearing the shofar every morning for the next month leading up to Rosh Hashanah. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that once again, we have the menorah. On the left of the menorah, we have an etrog. And then there are two symbols that I really can't make out. One seems to be, it looks like a heart, but it's probably an acanthus leaf. And the other one, a scroll, perhaps, a Torah scroll. But I do want to read the inscription. It says, Deutero. Then it goes from the first line into the second line. Gramateo, bene, merenti, dulcis, which is to say Deutero is a gramateo. He's a grammar school teacher. He teaches elementary school. Merente, he was a good man. Dulcis, he was sweet. And that is his epitaph. So we walked in and saw plaque after plaque after plaque of buried Jews who had been buried there in the Roman catacombs somewhere between the year 150 and the year 400 of the Common Era. And odds were fairly good that most of these graves that I visited had not been visited for 1,500 years or more. I'm reading the names. I'm sounding them out. They, because we're in Rome, they almost universally used Latin letters, our alphabet, in other words. But many of the names were Greek names because the Jews from the East spoke Greek as well as Hebrew and Aramaic. As I'm following through and going through name after name after name, Jew after Jew of the hundreds buried in this catacomb and feeling very powerfully that I am indeed walking through a cemetery, unbidden by me, unconsciously, I heard myself singing. And I was singing, El male rachamim, shochen bam ramim, hametzei menucha nechona, tachat kanfei hashchina. And I would fill in the name of the dead as I walked from grave to grave, singing El Mole Rachamim for them. Let's go to the third slide. So many of the slides had epitaphs. Some of them were just very simple. Here you can see a menorah on the left of the menorah, to our left, a lulav, and to the right of the menorah, 
kind of a funny looking etrog. Um, so this is what I went through. I obviously came out intact and was deeply moved by my experience in the Roman catacombs visiting these Jews. And I vowed that I would not leave them, that I would come back. In fact, I have visited that catacomb two other times since then, each time now prepared, singing El Malay Rachamim, bringing people with me. One time I even brought a minion with me so we could recite Kaddish in that burial ground. Let's go to the fourth slide, Ari. Here's another example of a menorah. And again, to the left of the menorah, you might be able to see there is a lulav with a nice binding at the bottom of it. To the right of the menorah, something like an atrog. Um, you can see that we are not in the catacombs. We're actually outdoors in this picture. And this is a menorah that is in the synagogue in Ostia Antica. Ostia is very close by to Rome. And in the ancient world, it was, in fact, the port city of Rome. You can now get there. Actually, it's on the subway line. You can just get in a subway and get off at Ostia. And if you're willing, again, to walk through weeds, you can go to a first century synagogue. That synagogue was built in the first century. Jews prayed there from the first and the fifth century. So I, I see someone has popped up a, a good question, Shuli Hirsch, that you get the menorah, but why the Lula Venetro? And it's, it's really an interesting question, which if you will ask it again, when we get to the end and we get to the Q&A, um, that'll give me enough time to come up with a good answer. So uh, I'll think about it while we're talking. Let's go back to the catacombs, back from Ostia into Rome again, down to the catacombs. By the way, there is a Jewish catacomb, for reasons not at all clear to me, on the grounds of Mussolini's former home. Um, so can we go to slide five? There we go. So you can see we're in the catacombs. You see the arch of the ceiling. And you might be able to see a um, below the menorah a, a little bit of a um, declivity. And we're going to see very, very clearly that this declivity is where they would put the bodies. It's the burial site. But I do want to show you the most famous menorah ever, ever, ever. And that's slide six. Ari, I would go bing, but I'm worried your computer would fall apart. So here is slide six. What we are looking at here is the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum. The Arch of Titus was built in the 90s. It commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem in the 70s, in the year 70. And what we are seeing is a triumphal procession of the Jews who are captives. You can see up at the front of the procession, there's a guy with his hands bound behind his back but they're carrying the menorah of the Jerusalem temple, the silver menorah. Rabbinic literature, Dio Cassius, almost every piece of literature we have from that period attests to the fact that when the Romans despoiled the temple, they brought the menorah back to Rome. I'm sorry, I said the uh, 90s, the the um, arch was actually erected by Titus's brother um, in the year 81. So here we have testimony within 10 years of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple of that famous menorah. Right next to the menorah is one of the silver fire pans. And then I, I mentioned this guy with his hands tied behind the back. Over his head are the trumpets, the silver trumpets that they would play in the temple. You're looking at a bas relief of actual Jerusalem temple implements. Okay, now we've seen very, very Jewish Rome or very, very Jewish Roman underground, literally underground. But in the catacombs, there are symbols that we don't quite know what to do with. So if we go to slide seven now, this is from the catacombs. This is on the ceiling of one of the catacombs. And this is, there's a lot of debate as to what we're looking at. This looks like it could be a Roman matron you can see that she's actually showing her uh, ankles, which is just crazy radical. Um, there are some scholars who suggest that perhaps she's a goddess. Um, although for my money, that would be somewhat out of keeping for the piety that we do find in the Roman Jewish catacombs. Um, 
one of my colleagues, when he saw it, was sure that this was the earliest picture we had of Carmen Miranda. But I, I'm dubious about that identification. But not far away, in another piece of art in the catacombs, these are um, paintings. They're, they're not quite frescoes. They're painted onto the tufa surface. Um, and in uh, slide number eight, you can see <clears throat> and so, there we go. In slide number eight, a little, these are called by um, art, art historians, puti, P-U-T-T-I. Um, they're also referred to as cupids. So we have these little cherubic guys and they are floating all over the catacombs. Um, now we know that in the sanctuary in Jerusalem and in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, that there were kruvim that we had our own cherubs. So this might be a depiction of the cherubs from the temple or from the tabernacle. But more likely, it is simply the puti, the little cherubic characters, and you can see he has wings, um, who flitter in and out of Roman art. Um, slide number nine, another beautiful example of Roman art. Um, I can't give you any deep background beyond the fact that somebody was a peacock and they wanted a peacock on their tomb. And so the artist was able to draw really a beautiful drawing. Um, this is, I, I took all these pictures um, and I took them with mostly with my phone. So we're not talking about sophisticated art here, but once you light these up, these are beautiful and well-colored pictures found in the catacombs. Uh, let's go to picture 10. Um, picture 10 is another one of these things that you can see all over Roman ancient art, in funerary spaces in particular. This is, a, it's called a cetus or a ketus. It is a sea monster. For those of you that know your Latin, it's also the term for a whale. And the whale is uh, here, obviously, a seahorse. And it is chasing after a dolphin. And you see it has that long squiggly tail. If we go across the street for a moment to the Christian catacomb, and that's the next slide, we'll see that they have the same figure, but now the sea monster is either swallowing or spitting out a human figure. And everybody agrees that that human figure is Jonah. We're now looking, they've repurposed the pagan art to be a picture of Jonah and the whale. Christian art particularly loves the motif of Jonah and the whale because Jonah, you may recall, um, was in the whale's belly three days. So that is for Christians, a symbol, a sign, a metaphor of Jesus rising on the third day. So they didn't like the pagan symbolism. They simply stuck Jonah into the picture. But now let's go back across the street to the Jewish catacombs, and we'll take a look at a beautiful palm tree. It's a date palm. Um, these palms like this do grow in Italy, but this is for sure one of the great um, trees and fruits of Eretz Yisrael. And you can see on either side are what's called by archaeologists a koch. A koch is an, they've dug into the soft stone. And on the soft stone, they can lay a corpse. When the corpse is put there, they will seal it up with plaster. And thus it serves as the sarcophagus. Sarcophagus, literally a flesh eater. The custom in Rome, as was the custom in the land of Israel, was to do two forms of burial. The first form of burial was in a sarcophagus. Here we have koch burial. We'll see in the land of Israel, they have these big stone sarcophagi that they would put the corpse in. A year later, the flesh had completely decayed, the sinews have decayed, and then you would come and gather the bones and put the bones in an ossuary. You can see if you have a keen eye that this particular piece of art had been painted and then they needed more room in the catacomb. So they just punched through the wall to make more room for more corpses. Let's go now to um, slide 13. Again, the same phenomenon. You have one, two, three declivities, three kochs, and one of them, the top one, 
first of all, very small, probably for an infant or a child. And the second thing you can see is, again, it interrupts the arts. First came the arts, and then they dug more. It looks to me like the, at the top, we have what was once a beautiful pomegranate, and they wanted to capture the purple. So they combined red and blue. Over time, either the red faded or the red peeled off, and we're left with a beautiful blue pomegranate. Now I want to show you how the Romans buried in a sarcophagus. This is slide number 14. And slide number 14, this is from the Capitoline Museum in Rome. Um, for those of you who have the opportunity, the privilege to visit Rome, the Capitoline Museum is hands down the best museum of the ancient world you will find. It may be the best museum in the ancient world you'll find anywhere in the world. It's all antiquities. It's all from the first, second, third, fourth century, from the time of the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors, and the pieces in there are just invaluable. So here you see on the side, a bas relief of the hunt. You see that in the center, he's killing a boar with a spear. And at the top are the couple who are buried in that sarcophagus. The Romans also would then collect the bones from the sarcophagus and uh, put them into an ossuary. This is in Rome. Now we're gonna jump down very quickly to Naples. The next slide, slide number 15. This is from the Roman sarcophagus in Naples. For those of you who have been to that museum, much of what is in the Naples Museum came from the city of Pompeii. Pompeii is a very short, it's literally one train stop from Naples. And Pompeii was covered over when Vesuvius erupted in, I think it was the year 79. And when it was excavated again during Mussolini's time, they were able to essentially restore a city intact. If you look at the very top of the sarcophagus, the lid, if you will, on the right-hand side, once again, you'll see our little seahorse. And in slide 16, I'm able to show you a detail of it. So Ari, if you can give me one more slide. There, there's the detail of the seahorse. And you can see in this that there is a being, a Nerid, who is riding the seahorse. This is a little um, nymph who rides in the ocean and serves the gods and goddesses of the ocean. So it's very, very much a pagan image, and that seahorse somehow finds its way into Christian and Jewish art. I want to jump now very quickly from Naples to the land of Israel. In the Galilee, in Beit Sha'arim, um, normally uh, I would ask for a show of hands, but there are uh, lots and lots of screens here, and I'm not going to know how many of you have been up to the Galilee and seen Beit Sha'arim. In Beit Sha'arim, there is a catacomb. And um, in that catacomb are buried some of the rabbinic, rabbinic leaders of the Jewish community. So we're all but guaranteed that what we should find in this catacomb should be, if you will, kosher. The inscription here says, I'll read first the Hebrew from right to left, and then we'll go to the line below it. Zo shela rabbi gamaliel. This is the fill in the blank sarcophagus of Rabbi Gamliel. We know of two or maybe three Gamliels. They're mentioned in the Mishnah. Gamliel I, Gamliel the Elder, who lived while the Second Temple was still standing. Gamliel II of Yavna, who had the misfortune of leading the Jewish community during the rebellion against Rome. And they may have had a grandson, Gamliel III. Um, and then if you look in Greek, it says Rabbi Gamaliel. For those of you that know New Testament, you may know that Paul, who writes in his epistles, Paul says he was a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. So here is an, ap an actual inscription from the time of Gamaliel, first, second century. And this very, I mean, there's no question that this is authentic. It's very likely that this is the leader of the Palestinian Jewish community in that period. So you, you wanna ask just how pious were these Jews? They were the leaders of the Jewish community. They're mentioned in the Mishnah, in the Talmud. These are our rabbis. So let's go to slide 18, Ari, and we'll see, oops, 
another image from the Beit Sha'arim sarcophagus. This is on the end of one of the sarcophagi. And if you know your Roman and Greek myths, you will see that that is the myth of Leda and the swan. So first of all, um, I'm not going to explain that myth. It's not actually for public discourse. Um, it involves bestiality. But um, the swan is actually Zeus in disguise. So this is a pagan god who is depicted on the sarcophagus in this very Jewish catacomb. Some of my archaeologist friends just can't deal with it. And they say, oh, 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 no, 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 no. The rabbis, no, they didn't do that. They, they must have got it secondhand. They couldn't afford, so they didn't know what they were buying. They were so ignorant. They were so pious. They didn't know the Greek myth. They just thought it was a duck or something. So um, without going all Marx Brothers on them and saying, why a duck? Um, I, I think there's nothing to be gainsaid by pretending that it is not repurposed by the Jews, which is to say, I think that our rabbis, the pious rabbis of the Mishnah and the Talmud, were utterly comfortable incorporating Greek mythology into their own burial practice. And that's, that's just a remarkable phenomenon. I want to jump now really to the east, outside of Eretz Yisrael, to the Dura, Dura Europa Synagogue. We are fortunate that on the border between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, there was a town called Dura. Dura is a very old town. It's actually mentioned in Ezekiel. But the synagogue of Dura Europus dates to the year 256 of the Common Era, so mid-3rd century. We're looking at the long wall of the synagogue. You can see in the middle of that wall is something that looks like either a chair or maybe they would put the Torah in there and cover it with a talus or a curtain or something. And one, two, three, four, there are actually five registers of bright live color. Um, this was excavated, and every one of the excavators who excavated it from Yale University, every single one of them wrote about what, how eye-popping the experience was to dig this out of the ground. It had been sitting there unseen for 1,700 years, and here is this rich, rich synagogue. You'll see just above the ark to the right, there's some fellow holding a scroll, um, and I'm going to, uh, which may in fact be Ezra reading the law. And then above him, there's another picture. And Ari, if you'll go to slide 20, we can get an idea of what's in that picture. So imagine sitting in shul and looking at the wall and seeing this kind of art on your wall. So this is that little picture. You can tell there's a fellow who's standing next to a bush. He's taken off his shoes. That's Moses at the burning bush. And you can see in the top left of that picture, which you need a close-up to be able to see it, there is God's hand coming out of heaven. So these Jews in Dura Europus were not even shy about depicting God in their synagogue arts. So there is Moses. You'll also notice Moses is wearing Roman clothing. He's wearing what is essentially a toga. I say essentially because it's got stripes on it. It doesn't mean he's wearing suspenders. No, no, no. No suspenders because you'll notice he's not wearing trousers. What those stripes are, those clavi, those stripes, are often called gamma because at the bottom they make what we might call an L. Looks like the Greek letter gamma. And that is peculiarly Jewish clothing. The gamma on the clothes immediately gives away that the person you're looking at is a Jew. Those of you who have ever visited a Catholic church, if you have a very keen eye, you will see exactly that stripe with the gamma at the bottom on the altar cloth of a Catholic church and sometimes on the priest's vestments as well, because they, the, the church, kept alive these Jewish traditions. So here's Moses depicted in the year 256 in Dura Europus. 
Now let's go to the next slide. It's another picture from Jewish history, from the Bible. This is King Ahasuerus. He's sitting on Solomon's throne. Ahasuerus, they say, despoiled the um, city of Jerusalem and took booty. What did he steal? He stole Solomon's throne. And if you can see very carefully, on either end of the stairs leading up to the throne are animals. Those animals were the animals that Solomon could vivify and speak with. You'll also notice that to our right, Ahasuerus' left, there is a woman again looking like Carmen Miranda, and she's got quite a thing on her head. She's wearing a tiara, and the tiara was all the rage in that period. The It is the cityscape, the landscape of the city of Jerusalem. So she is wearing a hat that depicts her as the um, basically the tutelar goddess, the, the patroness of the city of Jerusalem. So there is Esther wearing Roman garb. Ahasuerus is wearing Persian garb. The um, tiara is golden. And of course, you know what that means. That tiara is called Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, a Jerusalem of gold. Um, now, the Jews in the synagogue were entertained thoroughly because they also had the story of Moses being saved as a baby. So let's go to slide 22, and we'll get a real good idea of what was in that synagogue. So there's baby Moses. Notice his ark looks a little bit like, I don't know, a synagogue with a turret and a um, tower in it. And there is Pharaoh's daughter, stark naked. So um, apparently the Jews had no difficulty depicting a naked woman on the wall of the synagogue. Although I will tell you that if you get books of the pictures of Dura Europus, more often than not, someone has painted a bikini onto Pharaoh's daughter presumably for the sake of modesty. So let's go back now. I mean, I'm asking you, Ari, to go forward to slide number 23. So this is, again, the seat of Moses, and we're looking at what was at the top of the seat. To our left is, what do you expect? A menorah. And again, you can see the lulav and the etrog there. In the center above the seashell is something that looks like maybe a synagogue, maybe a temple, maybe the Jerusalem temple. And it too has that shell. The shell was a Roman symbol of a sacred place. They often put the shell above the goddess, although many of you are familiar with Venus rising from the sea. And of course, she's rising on a shell. That Venus is also known as our friend Aphrodite. But in the top right of our picture, you'll see that there is a fellow who has his back to us. In his right hand, he's holding a knife. Just below his feet, apparently closer to us, there is a ram stuck in the bushes. To his left, there is an altar. And above his head, looking like he's walking into a cave, is a teeny little guy. And that's Isaac. You're looking at a depiction of the Akedah from the third century. And that was a very, very popular motif in synagogues. If we go to slide 24, we'll see another Akedah, this time not a painting, but a mosaic. Can we change the slider? There we go. So here we have, you can really see that this is pebbles, teeny little pebbles that make up the mosaic. The um, mosaic is in the synagogue in Kibbutz Hepziba. It's called the Beit Alpha Synagogue. It's very, very popular on the tourist circuit. So I'm sure many of you have seen it. It is a Byzantine synagogue. It's probably from the 6th or 7th century. You have on the left of the picture, the famous two Yuds who are there holding the donkey. That would be exactly as we find in Genesis 22. The ram is tied to the bush. In case you're not sure, it actually says in Hebrew, Vihine Isle, and there is the ram. Just above the bush and the ram, it has, again, 
this circle with the hands sticking out, the circle seems to have wings. Is that God? Well, it's God who says, Al Tishlach Yarcha, don't put your hand on the boy. So again, this is either a depiction of God's angel or God on the floor of the synagogue in Beit Alpha. To the right of that is, of course, Abraham holding the knife. And again, he is literally identified as Avraham. You will notice, by the way, he is quite dark. All of these people have essentially African skin coloring, African features. Um, not that unusual when you think about the Torah and how much time we spent in Africa. And then finally, Abraham in his left hand is holding Isaac between him and the fire. And the depiction says Yitzchak, just so there is no mistake who we are about to sacrifice. I, I also love the fact that all of the Jewish males in this picture seem to have what we would nowadays call a Jufro. Um, they all have this, this penumbra of frizzy hair over their head. Now let's go back to Dora Europus. So we're, we're heading from the Galilee eastward to the border. Uh, it's on the Euphrates River, by the way. This is a picture of the election of King David. Samuel, who seems to be taller than everybody, and you'll notice Samuel is wearing the striped garment. You can see at the bottom the notched key, which are, is the gamma. And then all of David's brothers are wearing togas, like a good Jew should. Um, in, in fact, in the Roman world, when you wanted to show respect to Jewish um, nobility who were wearing a toga, they had the custom of kissing the garment, from which we get the phrase Kushmir and togas. Um, right? Yiddish speakers, you know that one, right? But um, I do want to point out one thing about David. David, of all of his brothers, David is wearing a purple garment. He is literally dressed in royal purple. In the Roman Empire, only the emperor was allowed to wear a garment entirely of purple. If you were a senator, you could wear a stripe of purple. If you were an equestrian, you could wear a little thin thread. But only the emperor could wear a garment entirely purple. And so the signal couldn't be clearer to the people sitting in shul that this is meant to be King David. And he really stands out from his brother. Since we mentioned King David, let's also jump down to Gaza. There's a synagogue in Gaza. And in the synagogue in Gaza, we have this mosaic. It's from the Byzantine era. Again, 500, 600. This is David playing his harp. So it's a beautiful picture. It says in good Hebrew, David. And there's a reason they label it King David. And you'll see that he has charmed the animals. There is a giraffe in the top right. There is what looks like maybe a panther and a snake. And David is able to charm the animals. But for those of you that know your Greek and Roman mythology, this is the Orpheus myth. Orpheus, who learned how to play harp from Apollo himself. Orpheus, whose mother was Calliope. And when I say Calliope, I don't mean the instrument. I mean the demigoddess. So King David is depicted in the standard art of the Greco-Roman world. I want to go back once more to the Beit Alpha synagogue. We saw just before the binding of Isaac, but here is the central panel of the synagogue. And in that panel is the Zodiac. You can see all the months of the year. Let's see if we can find, um, I'm, looking, I'm looking to see if there's the, the twins, there's the oxen, there's um, the fish. I want to find the scales because I know that's Tishrei, but I don't see it. And then in the four corners are the um, different seasons, and they're there's, all there's labeled a, there's a in person Hebrew. Holding the scales to the left there. Oh, yes, so. thank you. There it is. And it says Mosnaim, which means scales, but that is the, the zodiac 
signed for the month of Tishrei. But what's in the middle of this? In the middle of the Zodiac, there is a god, the sun god, who is riding the four horses. These look almost comical, but they are four horses. He's riding a quadriga across the sky. This is the sun going across the sky. This is Helios, Zeus Helios, right there on the floor of a synagogue. If you want to be scandalized, be good and scandalized. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide is the synagogue of Hamat Tiberia in Tiberias. Again, you can see all of the zodiac, although if your eye is keen, you can see they're labeled in Hebrew, some correctly, some backwards. Probably the workman was either illiterate or was not Jewish and didn't know how to write Hebrew, so he just copied it but got it in mirror image. But smack in the middle of that, again, Zeus Helios, a very handsome Zeus, if you will, um, and he is wearing a halo that is radiating sun. So I just, again, I want to emphasize that the, um, the backward Hebrew lettering is not the slide. That's actually the way it is on the floor in Hamat Tveria. One more, this time from Tsipori, Sepphoris. Uh, by the way, Tveria, Tsipori, these are cities that were chock full of rabbis. These are the cities that produced the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Midrashim. Now on the floor in Tsipori, Helios, maybe not a human image, but the sun itself and the four horses riding through. Um, while we're in Sipori, let's look at a house in the neighborhood, slide 30. That is called Dionysus House. Every single image on the floor of that house is pagan, 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 pagan. Um, now, we know Jews lived, they were the majority in the city of Sipori, but we know that pagans live there. So this could, in fact, be a pagan house, a Roman house, but it could also be a Jewish house, and they liked pagan art. And here is a close-up for our last slide, a close-up from that house. If you go and you go to Tsipori and you have a Jewish um, tour guide, he will tell you you're looking at the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. Feh. If, if that is a goddess and she's got a Cupid next to her, you know that that is Venus or Aphrodite and Cupid. So I will talk at length about Aphrodite and her little friend Cupid and her relationship with our rabbis of blessed memory. She appears in rabbinic literature. And in two weeks, we're actually going to read some stories from rabbinic literature about the goddess Aphrodite. But for now, I just want to give you a little commercial that next week, we're going to study Pirkei Avot. And I hope to be able to show you that Pirkei Avot is a very good piece of Roman philosophy, of Stoic literature. But I think we have a few minutes left, and I would be delighted. Um, I know you've been filling the chat, but now, um, Ari, it's your job to know who to call on and who not to call on, and I will try to answer your questions. So um, here are some questions. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. What do you teach at the Pontifical Institute? And why are they bringing you back? Are you going to teach something different next time? So let me, let me share with you some of the ironies of history. There are two pontifical universities that actually have Jewish studies programs as part of their interfaith studies. One is the Gregorian, which is Jesuit. And the other is the Angelicum, which is Dominican. And I, I don't know what to make of the fact that the Jesuits and the Dominicans were the denominations that persecuted the Jews through the Middle Ages. So I don't know, maybe they're doing tshuva or something, but they do have these programs. The first time I taught at the Gregorian and at the Angelicum, which was in 2014, I taught Judaism and Christianity in the first five centuries. Um, I'll tell you a story. I asked the head of the Jesuit university, all right, look, I know that for the rabbinic literature I'm going to teach, I should bring translations, but I can, I can do the Greek and the Latin sources in the original with you Jesuits, right? And there's a dead silence, and the head of the program says, uh, well, uh, Rabbi, um, uh, I think 
for our priests, it would be helpful if you had translation. So this Jew, this rabbi, had to teach Jesuit priests church documents in Latin and Greek in translation because I could do it and they couldn't. Um, but I had a good education at the Jewish Theological Seminary. This time around, by the way, I'm doing straight out introduction to rabbinic literature. I will slant it because I know the interests of, of New Testament and church fathers, but it's, it's a straight out rabbinic literature course. And I will have a special one hour session each week for those who would like to read Mishnaic Hebrew with me. Perfect. Um, if Esther and Andy want to go to Rome and see the Jewish catacombs, can they do it if they pay the same person or, or is it only available to famous professors? If Esther and Andy come to Rome between February 14th and March 24th, I will make sure we can all three visit together. But in general, can anybody see these catacombs? There is now a site, I think it's called Jewish Rome, where there is a Jewish tour guide who's going to take you to everything she wants you to see. But if you insist... And again, if you give her a little bit of um, a um, financial incentive, she will get you into the Jewish catacombs and show you around. Are there any famous rabbis or personalities that we should know about who are buried in these catacombs? In the Roman catacombs, no. In the Jewish catacombs in the Galilee, yes. The rabbis of the Mishnah. Um, so... Um, Rochelle asks about the art, at, I believe it's at Dura Europas, and wants to know how it was preserved so, so that we can actually see those great photos. Is that something? It's, that it's an amazing it story. Dura on the Euphrates River is literally on the border between the Persian and Roman Empire. And in the third century, they were constantly battling one another. And that city went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The synagogue, as it happens, is right at the wall of the city. So when there was a siege of the city, they took sand and dirt and buttressed that wall. And the city fell. And 1,500 years later, they were able to remove the dirt and still have the original colored wall there. So it's nothing short of a miracle that it was preserved. The um, actual wall is still intact in the museum, unfortunately, the museum in Damascus. But there is a life-size replica in Yale University, and there are smaller replicas at the Museum of the Diaspora at um, in Tel Aviv and in the... There's a museum downtown, the Yeshiva University Museum, also has a very small replica of it. Um, there's a question about whether there's a catalog of the art and the catacombs in Rome that people can read and enjoy. Not that your handheld photos in the dark on your you know, camera weren't so, the best first thing of all, I've ever seen. In, in, in my publishers were lovely, and in... Um, Aphrodite and the Rabbis, there are many colored photos and many black and whites, but there is... Um, a book or two, a book called Underground Rome. I'm blanking on his last name by my friend. He's um, from the Netherlands, Len. I'll have it for you by next week. And um, you can see the art and his explanations in that book. Um, Julian wants to know why the Lulav and Etrog as symbols on the Jewish tomb. Oh, great Judaism. question. So it's an interesting thing. The menorah, um, and somebody corrected me. I saw it flash by on the um, chat. The menorah was, in fact, gold, not silver. The implements were silver. The menorah was gold. Um, somebody once asked me, so were you able to see the menorah? Is it hidden in the Vatican? And I assured them, as I will assure all of you, that probably within 10 years of capturing the menorah, that gold was melted down and turned into coinage. Um, I think that Sukkot was the most popular of the festivals. We all think Passover is the most popular because you can do it at home. They wanted to go to Jerusalem. They wanted to go for Sukkot. And Sukkot was the easiest of all the festivals to observe because you didn't need a hotel room. You stayed in a sukkah. So all you needed was to buy a lulav and etrog. They're beautiful symbols of the season. And probably everybody and their grandmother had a recipe for esrog jelly. So, uh, it, it for that and it, it became a ubiquitous. I'm tempted, but fortunately we have very little time left. I'm tempted to give a long Freudian explanation, but I won't. 
we did have a CSP program about the origins of the etrog and how they came from, how it came from China to Israel and how it was then incorporated by the rabbis, which ties into your basic um, presentation today. And I assume that you'll be making over the next uh, two sessions is that the rabbis took what was around them into Judaism and made something Jewish about it. But the etrog became the symbol that differentiated Judaism from other. Very, very likely. I noticed in the chat, this very last thing, Marsha Folk says that um, we, we have always been taught, primarily taught by German Lutheran art historians, that the Jews are an artless people. And they did not mean that kindly. They denied that we had art. In truth, in the Second Temple period, as long as the temple was standing, all of the art we have up until that point is geometric design. It's only after the Second Temple falls that we start getting pictorial images. And once we started getting them, they became incredibly rich. So the truth is we have a very, very rich history of Jewish art going all the way back to the third century, maybe even the second century. And I hope I gave you a taste of that because part of the point of the taste was to show you that the Jewish art, aside from the Lula and Etrog and Menorah, I mean, the obvious Jewish symbols, the art is very much of a piece with the Roman world. And we were very comfortable in that world with its symbols, including Greek and Roman goddesses and gods and cupids and things like that. So Jimmy asks a question, I may put it in a different way, which he asks, how were the rabbis able to justify having pagan art like the art you showed us in synagogues, in the catacombs, and so on? Um, but maybe we can ask a different question. Did the rabbis actually, were they okay with it? Was it the people who just did it and the rabbis then went along with it and then made it into, gave it Jewish meaning? So it's think? an excellent question. I'm going to put you off a little bit because one of the texts we're going to read in the third session directly addresses the problem of pagan art and how the Jews can, in fact, be comfortable with it. So that's we'll get to that. But the I want to ask a question in return, which is, why do we assume that the rabbis had such power and influence over the Jews, even in synagogues? And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly confronting this with my rabbinical students who actually think that they're going to go out and take a congregation and everyone's going to say, yes, sir. And they have clearly not met the Jews because um, rabbis often in their synagogues have very little influence. And if, uh, you know, you talk to the building committee or the arts committee in a synagogue, the first thing they learn is don't ask the rabbi. So um, some things seem to never change. Uh, do you find the incorporation of art um, in other parts of the world where Jewish communities um, situate themselves to be similar in that um, images that were in the marketplace or in other societies, like say India um, or you know Iraq, Iran, did that come into the synagogues there as well, like we're seeing here? I probably know best the Indian art. And the Indian art unquestionably it has Jew, excuse me, Jewish motifs. But anyone that looks at it knows it's from India. Everything about it s s tastes like India, smells like India, looks like India. So the art is a very Indian. I'm looking over my computer at two pieces of Indian Jewish art on my walls in which the characters in the art, one of whom is Joseph, are painted blue because that is the standard of Indian miniature art. Um, in terms of China, places like that, the Jewish community is much younger and in large measure European. So I, I don't want to comment on the art. Um, I was in the Shanghai synagogue and it looked like it could have been the Beit Midrash in any synagogue in Europe as well. So. Okay, okay well, it's exactly 6.01. We finished uh, session one. You've given us the promo for session two. Can you tell people what is going to be in session three so they get the whole view of what we're doing here? So. S session two, we're going to look at texts from Pirkei Avot. And uh, Pirkei Avot is very sweet. It's, you know, very nice wisdom literature. It sounds like the Boy Scout manual. But one of the things I'm going to show you is nonstop, it situates the rabbis very much as part of the Greco Roman philosophical world, and in particular, Stoicism. The rabbis were good Stoics. The third section.
book early rabbinic text from the second century will um, actually confront Aphrodite directly uh, with the rabbis. And uh, we will end with a lovely story about a rabbinical student who has an encounter with a lady of the night. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope that uh, whets your appetite for our three-part series. I wanted to thank um, Esther Dasik for um, hounding me to bring uh, Professor Vazadsky to CSP. I wanted to thank Professor Vazadsky for being with us online. I want to thank you all for being with us. I know it's an unusual time, and the Browers are really hungry. They want to go to dinner at 6 o'clock already. Right. I understand. And in, in New York, you want to go to bed already. I get that, too. But um, thank you for being with us. Uh, so being with us. Ari, next week, everybody should make it a cocktail hour. I, are you allowed, is it drinking and learning? I mean, is that okay? Is that okay by the rabbis? I don't know. Maybe. If that's what they do, if that's what they do at JTS, if that's what they do at JTS and at the Pontifical Institute, it's good enough for us. So there you go. Think uh, of it as kiddish. Bring your bring your uh, margarita with you, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Hopefully, we'll see you uh, this week as well when we um, study with uh, Professor Danny Matt, and we go to London to the National uh, Portrait Gallery. Take care. Thank you, Professor Vazatsky. Bye, everybody. Good to see you. I see Rita. Rita, good to see you. Barry Mitnick, nice to meet you. Uh, who else is new? Marjorie Falk. Well, you're with us. Thank you. And uh, Dahlia Podwall, as usual, nice to see you. Say hi to Shalom, please. I see Ann Spector. Robin Dexter, I see your forehead. Uh, who else do I see? Oh, I, I already said hi to Faith. Oh, there's Robin. Okay. Oh, Lindy Kaiser. Thank you for the donation to CSP, Lindy. And thank you for the card. I haven't even thank you for the nice card you sent us this summer. We took advantage of the present inside. I took Amy out for lunch in at Big Bear. And Professor Vazowski is like, what is going on here? You don't have to stay. I'm just saying hi to some people. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Be safe. Bye.